Lady of Lords, pray with us now as we begin one more year in honor of your son. Bienvenue, welcome to Lords. We have an expression at Lords Volunteers that we love it when Our Lady introduces us to her friends. And today we're going to meet a wonderful special friend. She's actually the first volunteer who signed up to come with us, which is really brave and courageous way back when. So we have this wonderful opportunity also to have Father with us today. And so Father, you come from? The Diocese of Rockford in Illinois. Yeah, Father Sean Grismer and I um, traveled several times with you, all two Lords. Uh, to experience the wonderful gift that Our Lady brings. And it is. So in 1858, the Mother of God came down from heaven, and she appeared to a little girl named Bernadette Subirous in the grotto, which is a cave in the side of the beautiful Pyrenees Mountains, and miracles began to happen. These are scientifically documented, inexplicable cures that go through an exhaustive research by the scientists and the church to determine whether or not they can explain what happened. It's then a bishop who says they're an official miracle in the church. And there are 70 at Lourdes of the 7,200 inexplicable cures. But we also know that there's many miraculous graces that take place at Lourdes, conversions, deepening of faith, complete and extraordinary graces that come to bring us closer to our Lord. And so today we have a special friend of mine. I know I'm gonna probably do this, so I might as well get it out of the way, but um, I always call her Mishi, not that she's mine, but so <laughs> Sheena, when they hear your accent, they'll probably know you are from? I'm from Scotland. Yes. But I live in Pennsylvania now. Right. So an American living in Pennsylvania with a beautiful Scottish lilt. So Father does not know you and has only just met you this morning. So maybe you can tell us a little bit about how you and I got to know each other. Oh boy. We, uh, when I was living in England, I would go to a conference with the church in Germany every year, and I met Marlene at a conference, and she was introducing her idea of the, the Lourdes volunteers. And before I even heard her speak, I said, uh, I would like to volunteer. And it was, it was something totally out of my comfort zone, something I'd never imagined doing. Going to the conference was something I'd never imagined doing. And here I went to the conference and then volunteered with Marlene. And uh, I didn't know anything about Lourdes or Bernadette or really, I was quite a new Catholic. I, it's not that long since I'd converted, but I just felt this pull that mm. this was something I had to do. This was just, I just had to. And, you know, we've got seven kids. I didn't think we could probably afford it. I thought my husband would say no. One of our children had bad asthma and I'd left him at home to go to the conference and I was worried about leaving him and I couldn't think of leaving him again, but I did. And I'm glad I did. It was <laughs> so if I may, the first North American Lord's Volunteer wasn't a North American. <laughs> this is true. That's amazing. I had no true. idea. That's wow, that's brilliant. Catch, Father, yeah. because you hadn't become a citizen yet. No. Yeah, no. Good catch, Father. <laughs> Thank you. That was very good, yeah. No, I wasn't so, a citizen yet, but I was living as an American. Yeah, so she, you married an American young, though. You were 19 yeah, when you... I was 19 you, when we got married, yeah. Yeah, so married an American, so, and yeah. now an American citizen living in Pennsylvania. Mm -hmm. But always, I love that you have your beautiful accent. Oh, thank you. Yeah, so, so you came to Lourdes, and um, we had come to serve. And I think one of the expressions that we have is, you know, we always receive more than we give. We don't expect that, but it happens. That's right. And so we were in the baths, and I we call it crying Thursday. Mm -hmm. It's because a lot of the emotions that happen at being in service to the women that are coming in, it's your grandmother, it's your daughter, it's your sister, it's, you know, we see such incredible suffering, very intimate, um, you know, exchange between us and helping these pilgrims into the water. And usually by Thursday, if there's gonna, we call it crying Thursday because usually by then it's just overwhelming sometimes. And so we came out of the baths and you had had your own bath that day and um, you and I went for tea. So that's for, you know, the expression, you know, we're having tea. We're, this is real tea, by the way. <laughs> she brought you it, provided for, it for us. <laughs> she brought us real tea here. And it is. So you came, and you and I went for tea. We and did. you we went Then for this tea. is when we spoke about 
the great grace you were given in the band. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. As a, as a teenager, um, one thing led to another and I was 15 and I was pregnant and my family was not religious at all. My mom was born out of wedlock and suffered her whole life from the stigma of that badly. And she couldn't bear the thought of another baby being brought into the world that way. And abortion had just been legalized recently. And she took me to the doctor and they said that they would take care of it. And I begged, I cried, I just couldn't bear the thought of them taking the baby, but they did. And mom didn't do it out of malice. She did it because she loved me. And that was her way of solving a problem. But I never ever got over that baby. And a couple of years later, I met my husband and we got married. And then we had two miscarriages the first year we were married. And I always thought that was God punishing me because I had been so, so bad and let them kill the baby. And so he took my next two babies. So the years went on and I had seven kids and about halfway through that time, Jeff's mom died and her dying wish was for, his, for Jeff to come back to the church. So I was brought up not religious at all, but in Scotland, there was a, people were not religious. You either were or you weren't, but it was frowned on in my family because, the, because of the troubles in Northern Ireland. So when she died, I said, over my dead body, we're going to go to the Catholic Church. There's no way. And then I thought, well, you can't really dismiss something until you know what it is. So I went and talked to Father Kelly and I found out that's what I've been searching for my whole life. He was just amazing. And all the things I believed already, I didn't know Mary yet. I, I didn't know anything about Mary yet. But when I talked to Father Kelly every week, it was just another, I didn't know this. This is what I've always believed. This is what I've been searching for. So I came into the church that Easter. and uh, With the children? With the children, absolutely with the children. We'd always gone to church. I'd always been searching. We'd gone to so many different churches. Wherever we lived, I, the one that was in walking distance, we went to, and they were all baptized or christened. Or um, When I was growing up, we lived across the street from a church, and uh, I used to watch out the window, and my mum worked in a pub. And she'd say, those men you see going in there in the morning with their wives, I see them at night with their girlfriends. You don't need to be going to church. They're all hypocrites. You don't need to be going. So we were brought up against any church. Uh, my little brother once played with a Catholic family and he got beaten for it because that was even worse, was to play with a Catholic family. He was a little boy from a Catholic family. And uh, so when I came into the church, it was very much against my family, but it was like I'd come home. It was what I'd been searching for my whole life. And the day that Father heard my confession, oh, it was just, oh, it was, I, I can't even describe it. So. Can I ask how old were you when you came into the faith? Um, it was when I was pregnant with Heather and she's 20, I was probably about 30. Okay. Okay. And then how long after that was it that you went to Lourdes? Maybe about 15 years. Yeah. Yeah, I'm not very good with dates, but yeah, about that. Yeah. She would have been I don't go 10 by years. Dates. I was a ten size years. 10. <laughs> <laughs> I have to go by when kids were born. <laughs> I was pregnant with Heather when I came into the church. Yeah. And Alexander was a baby when I went to Lourdes. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, maybe not 15 years, yeah. not, not that long. But uh, I knew I was forgiven, that I'd, you know, I, Father had heard my confession, and that was like one of the most amazing days of my life. I just remember crying. I couldn't believe that I was worthy to, to be forgiven, that, that Christ died for 
to forgive me, the, just such a bad, terrible person. And here I was forgiven and clean for the first time in my life. But still I felt like it was still my fault those babies died because I had done that horrible, terrible thing. So when I went to Lourdes and had the bath, it was like it all washed away. And I really don't have a lot of memories of it because it's like being in a different world. It's like, uh, I remember going back to England after that pilgrimage and was being asked to talk in front of the congregation. And I was trying to think of what words to say. And I thought if I could just stand there and just kind of glow and just pass the words that way, that would work because there's no way to put that into words. There just isn't words to describe that, that cleansing and forgiveness and to be able to finally forgive myself a little bit as well and to feel like I'd given in service as almost a penance as well. But yeah, it was... How you describe it to me, you said, there's been a hole in me. Mm -hmm and nothing has filled the hole right. until this liquid grace. That's Those it, exactly. are the words you used. That was it, exactly. The liquid grace filled the hole. Yeah. And then you didn't realize it at the time, but your pastor mm -hmm. wrote a letter with a generous gift, and he said, we sent one of our parishioners to Lourdes to serve, and she returned to illuminate our oh, entire wow. parish community. I did, oh. did glow. <laughs> So you got your wish. Oh. And it was so extraordinary that he wrote that. And I, he asked it to be in confidence, but he's recently died. And so I finally was able to tell you that he wrote that beautiful letter and said, I, we want this light to shine in other women. Mm -hmm. And uh, But I think one of the things, too, that you say is that this has to be shared also for men. It has to be shared for men. Uh, two of my sons lost babies this year to miscarriage and they're both really broken. And I would encourage all men to come to Lourdes and, and find the same healing because it affects the fathers as, as much as it affects the mothers. They've lost a baby too. So the, the, the miscarriage is, uh, is, is a terrible loss as well. I want to, I'm sorry, one of the things I find um, amazing is first off, you're not the only person I know that's gone to Lourdes and been healed of that trauma in their life and received healing into them. But how Mary, who is um, perpetually virgin, the Immaculate Conception, Immaculately Conceived, um, she's the one who gave birth to the, the Savior. Um, but instead of, <clears throat> instead of being the one to condemn women, she's the one to free women from that. And in fact, yesterday I was speaking with one of the ladies, um, a similar story as yours, and and she said that those who, who, who act as if like it doesn't affect them, it, it, there's something deep down that's, that's hurting. And she found that freedom as, as you did in Lourdes. And as you say, the men too. The men too, and the fathers of the babies that are aborted too. Yeah. I mean, that's such a loss. And they've got no control. A lot of the fathers maybe didn't want that to happen, but they've got no control over it. They really need to heal. I think another, for me anyway, knowing you so well and loving you is that you're so loving and, and wonderful to your mother. It, it, it could be a different way. It, Absolutely. Could, it could be, but I think that's, first of all, it's your nature and it's a beautiful grace the way you are. But I think that it's a grace also of that healing of that was the healing of all that surrounds it. Yeah. Was there like a moment in your life where you had to choose, I mean, you, you even said of, of your mother, you said she didn't do it out of malice, she did it out of love for me. Um, was there, a, but obviously there was hurt there in your part. Was there a moment in your life that you um, forgave her or that you said like, I can't, I, I can't be angry anymore. And you like surrendered that, is that a part of? Well, she went, you went kicking and screaming. I did go kicking and screaming. She did, they were <laughs> literally dragged you, pulled the hair out of your head yeah. to pull you in there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, it took me a while, but she really didn't do it out of malice. She did it out of love. She, she was just misguided. Yeah. 
and she didn't do it to hurt me. She did it to protect me and to protect the baby because the baby could never feel hurt. The excuses and the reasons people give for abortion is to, to help the baby or to save the baby from things that might happen, you know, poverty or... They're not good reasons, but they're what people believe in their heart. They just don't know. And also in Scotland, you were underage, so... I was underage. Your she, mother yeah. gets to make those decisions. She did. Right. She said if I didn't agree, she would put me into care, uh, you know, have me fostered out. And, and there's a lot of fear then. Um, you know, when I speak to mothers or grandmothers who have daughters who either are contemplating abortion or have had abortions, sometimes they're in disbelief, you know, and they'll say, like, I can't believe they did this. But, but so much of that is out of fear, you know? And, and, and you said misinformation. Misinformation. People don't realize that that's a baby and that it's got a whole life ahead. It's a person. Yeah. And, and, and to be so, what, you were being forced and, yeah. but, but many are, they just don't know. They just don't know. We need to know. educate people. And yeah. even the last baby I lost um, was the last baby that I carried. And when I called to get the results, they said, it's a positive test. Would you like to keep this baby or not? I said, how could you even say that? And she said, well, it's not a good thing for everyone. You have to understand, we have to give you the option. And that devastated me right there. But they, I lost that baby at 12 weeks and it took me from Wednesday to Saturday to, to miscarry. And I called them every day and when I, when I lost the baby on Saturday, I said, I've, I've miscarried, what should I do? And they said, well, did you flush it? I said, no, that, how could I flush it? That's my baby. And they said, well, if you didn't flush it, you know, I guess you could bring it in on Monday. So I called on Monday and they said, you didn't flush it? I said, no, that's the baby. I said, the baby's in the fridge next to my chicken in a baggy in a Tupperware container and they were they were incredulous that I didn't just flush the baby. At 12 weeks? At 12 weeks it was it was a baby and when I did get in to see the doctor she opened up the sack and she showed me the baby and it was this pure white little baby the size of my thumb with little arms and legs and just the most beautiful thing ever just beautiful but how could you flush that? <laughs> But if people knew that that was what, that there's a baby there, maybe they wouldn't be so quick to, to terminate their pregnancy because it's a real baby. Now, can I ask, did you name your children, um, those three children? Well, it's funny you should ask because I was just remembering the last baby would have been Bernadette and I didn't know anything about Lourdes. I just loved that name, <laughs> the last baby, because yeah. I've been thinking a lot about it since you've asked me to do this. And I was trying to think, I just don't know what to say. And then I remember she would have been, I don't know if she was a boy, if it was a boy or a girl. I didn't notice, I didn't look. I was just in awe of this beautiful little white, just this beautiful white baby. But uh, she would have been Bernadette. So that would have been. And the others, I didn't. So Our Lady really had she her eye on you before you yeah, became a Catholic, knew. before you went to yeah, Lourdes. Absolutely. Right from the beginning. Yeah. 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 It's a beautiful grace to know but, that. Yes. And after that baby, I just prayed the rosary constantly, just for months, just walking to school with the kids. I'd be praying the rosary over and over and over and over. Not even the whole rosary, just the Hail Mary. Because I've never been good at remembering all the other things. <laughs> yeah, just could, Hail Mary, Hail Mary. Could I ask, when was your mentality shift from God's punishing me to, and that I'm like not worthy, was your mentality shift when you went to confession, when you went to Lourdes? Was there something else in there that was a combination of when it went from God's punishing me to he's not punishing me, but, but he is merciful and he's forgiving well, me? I think it was when I went to confession that that first really, I just felt like a weight was lifted off me and it was like washed away. And uh, that, was, that was really amazing. But there was still that lingering, but really though, I still did the bad thing and even if it maybe wasn't my fault I had a miscarriage or that I had the abortion, I was forced to do it. There must have been something I could have done to stop it or if it wasn't bad in the first place, that wouldn't have happened. 
So that's still my fault. I still had to take responsibility for the miscar or for the abortion because if I hadn't done what I did, that wouldn't have happened. Uh, the, the boy was 22 years old and I was 15. And he had other people that he had also had children with and left. So I thought we'd live happily ever after, but you know, I was a kid. <laughs> <laughs> when, when you came back from Lourdes and you were illuminating the entire church, <laughs> uh, what, was, what was life like after that for you? Oh, for a while it was really, really good. Um, I le led a prayer group called Mother's Prayers, um, where we all got together and prayed for our children, born and unborn. Um, and that was really good. And I was a Eucharistic minister. My kids were all altar servers or lectors. If you got the bulletin, it would be lang, 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 lang. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we went to mass on a Saturday so we could serve on a Sunday. <laughs> so uh, yeah, it was really, really good after that. And then going back to Lourdes, every time I went back, there was you know more grace and more grace. Um, it was just, we had trouble with one of our teenagers and uh, I went to Lourdes to pray and offer offer up my service for, for, for our daughter. And when I came back, she came home. She, she'd left home at 16 also. And she came home that Thanksgiving and that was a direct grace from Lourdes. So the next year she came with us and she served in the kitchens and the piscines as a thank you to Our Lady for, for bringing her home. Yeah, so, and now she's uh, married with five kids and they're, her and her husband are both active in the church. So right. yeah, but every year there was something different that there was another grace. They're just, it, it, it overflows. It's just such an abundance of grace. I remember when you said, Lady. You measure your life from before, before you went to Lourdes, Lourdes mm -hmm. and after you went to Lourdes. That's right. It was that profound. It was. It absolutely was. And, you know, I think that, you know, maybe today we can pray for um, mothers and fathers who are suffering like you did of, mm -hmm. um, to know God's great mercy, to know the great grace. And if someone wants Lourdes water, if they can't go to Lourdes, if they just want the water that you bathed in that gave you such a grace, We'd be happy to send that we can have it at the end but maybe father we can sheena we can pray for that sheena thank you for sharing your story what a wonderful wonderful gift and testimony so thank you for thank you having the courage to do so thank you yeah let's pray in the name of the father and of the son and of the holy spirit god i thank you and i praise you for your daughter sheena and i thank you for her courage and her faithfulness to be so vulnerable not only with Marlene and I, but with all those who uh, have taken to watching this. Jesus, I lift up to you all mothers and fathers, all women and men uh, who have been living in the mindset that you punish them, or who've been living in the mindset that you're displeased with them, who've been living with the mindset that they have to do more in order to uh, attain your love. And for all of those who have been suffering the loss of a child, either through their, uh, the act of abortion or through miscarriage, or uh, through any other um, uh, post-birth death. God, we just lift them up to you. For you know the, their grieving hearts, and you, Blessed Mother, you who stood at the cross of your Son, you have the greatest kindness towards them. And I pray that you would gaze upon them, that they would see your love, that they would see the love of your son, Jesus, and they, may, they might be embraced by that love. Jesus, I thank you and I praise you. I love you. And I ask your blessing upon all who are watching today, the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Go in peace. Hallelujah. Hallelujah.